Welcome to the 3.12 and the 3.13 sections covering gene regulation. Now in these two sections we're going to focus first on prokaryotic gene control. So prokaryotes, smaller, simpler cells, they are going to have simpler gene regulation mechanisms. And the way this works is they still do want to, this is the why part, they still do want to only express the genes that they need because this conserves energy. To have all the genes on at the same time would create a bunch of proteins that are not needed to live. So much like you turning on every light in your house, every electronic device, when you're only sitting in one room, potentially like, you know, reading a book, it's wasteful. And so as a cell, if you're using all that energy for something that's unnecessary, that's energy that you can't put towards survival and you can't put towards reproduction. So in the long scheme of things, you are going to have difficulty surviving via natural selection or difficulty thriving. Your genes will not spread much because they're not good genes. They're wasteful. And so the way that prokaryotes go about controlling their genes, but in a more simple way, is by using operons. And so what operons are going to be is they're going to be a group of related genes. So this means, like in the case of the LAC operon, which is on the bottom here, uh, that's going to be the three enzymes needed to break down lactose sugar. So because we need several enzymes to go through this entire digestive process, what prokaryotes do is they just group them all together in one package. And then they control the package as a whole. So you've got the promoter and the operator at the beginning here, but if this operator is a regulatory sequence, all right, so if there's no repressor bound, you know, if there's an activator bound, whatever you need, it's the same general principles, then you can have RNA polymerase bind and then go through and transcribe this entire section, so all the genes. And so the genes are either all on or all off. Now you've got lots of different operons that prokaryotes can have. It's not like there's just one. Uh, but each of these operons is going to consist of a group of related genes, not individual genes. So this still gets the job done, but it does so in the easiest way possible. Eukaryotes will have still the same idea of they're trying to just use what they need, but they'll be able to do it individually. So each gene will have its own control mechanisms. So they can turn on three enzymes needed to break down lactose, but they'd have to flip three separate switches to do it, not one, because they won't be grouped together. Now, with eukaryotes, they will have a promoter, that's the sequence that's at the beginning of a gene, and that will have the Tata box, which is going to be a thymine adenine, thymine adenine. There's actually two more adenines as well that we just kind of leave off because they're not critical. Uh, and so this will be the sequence where we can have many of these regulatory proteins bind to help determine whether or not RNA polymerase can bind and if RNA polymerase binds, remember, that means we do transcription. If we do transcription, that means we're going to ultimately express that gene. And so you might see regulatory proteins written instead as transcription factors, and that's just trying to ultimately illustrate the fact that these are controlling transcription, because that's really what it means to have a gene on, is that you're doing transcription. And you'll remember that these transcription factors, regulatory proteins, whatever you want to say, I'm only really making you know two of the groups of them. And so you've got the activators and you've got the repressors. And each of them does what you'd expect. Activators will turn on a gene, they'll start transcription, they'll bind RNA polymerase, whereas repressors will turn off a gene, they will restrict RNA polymerase attaching, they will prevent transcription. Now, there's also in animals, these genes called homeobox genes, they're sometimes called Hox genes, and you might see them called architect genes. Now these don't code, for instance, for the type of eye you have. What they do is during development, they trigger the gene expression that says I want you to put eyes in these locations and I want this many of them. So they're really about placement and number of things. And this is important because during evolution, we oftentimes get these anomalies like a millipede where it looks as though it'd be very difficult to gradually evolve more and more segments, more and more legs to get to be potentially a long, you know, hundreds of legged organism from something that originally was probably much more like an insect. But knowing like we do now about homeobox genes or Hox genes and insects, they call them, uh, we realize that you can screw up one gene and that gene normally just says, all right, let's put one or two segments here. 
and then you get the normal six, eight, whatever your typical more uh, arthropod is what we call them, but you know, spiders and insects, the number of legs they typically would have. But if we screw up that one gene and it just keeps saying, let's do another segment, another segment, another segment, and each segment still uses those same pre-existing genes that build a segment, build legs, build the organs, and so they just kind of stutter, so they do a whole bunch of segments, we can pretty easily get from something that's a smaller insect-like organism to a larger millipede with a single mutation. You know, not huge changes. We don't have to evolve whole other segments over and over again. As long as we have one segment that's functional, we can just repeat. And so you can see an example of this where ultimately this guy has antennapedia. So this is a fruit fly that has a messed up hox gene. And so that means it accidentally said grow legs instead of antennae. So it's got leg antennae. Uh, so that's just one example of how you can mess with this. This could also explain stuff like spiders with eight eyes versus the more traditional two or less. Once again, it does not code for what type of eye. It's kind of cool. You can actually take a hox gene uh, from a fruit fly, put it in a mouse, and they're fine. Because both of them say put two eyes up at the front, and it doesn't say what type of eye. So a mouse will still grow a mouse eye there, and a fruit fly still grows a fruit fly there, because that's a whole other set of genes. All they're doing is saying number and placement. All right, the last bit we have is cancer. Well, hopefully this isn't the last thing you have, but still. The idea there is cancer is going to be uncontrolled cell growth, so you no longer can control how often a cell divides, which you want to. That, that's beneficial. And that's because we normally have some genes that kind of save us. And so these are called tumor suppressor genes, and these suppress tumors. Tumors are uncontrolled cell growth, like masses. Uh, and then we've got proto-oncogenes. And so both of these protect you from having cancer. So they're basically saying you're safe. And a cell can have five, six, seven of these all of which are protecting it from being a cancer cell. But over time, you can either turn off, inactivate, or you can break, damage, these genes. And so if I manage to screw up all my tumor suppressor genes, they're no longer controlling that cell to prevent it from reproducing too much. If I mutate my proto-oncogenes into what's called oncogenes, cancer genes, they no longer are preventing the cell from being cancerous. So what can happen from this is I now have a cancerous cell. And this cell can then start to divide and divide and just eat and divide, and it's not doing any work. It's just kind of leeching off your body. And eventually it can kill you because if it gets into a vital organ, it starts to crowd the cells in that organ. So imagine if you're trying to take something from one side of a room to another to package it up. And suddenly I start moving all these people in there, and these people aren't helping you. They're just taking up space. That's like the cancer cells. Eventually, if there's enough of them, you can't get from one side of the room to the other to do your job. And so the organ fails, and that can kill the person. The other trick up cancer, that cancer has up its sleeve is cancer can move within your body. So skin cancer really shouldn't kill you if it just stayed on your skin. We could just remove that piece of skin. Breast cancer shouldn't kill you if it just stayed within the breast tissue. Same thing with your colon. You can live without your colon. So if you got colon cancer, I could just remove the colon and then you'd be fine. The problem with all these is that these cancer cells can migrate elsewhere in your body. So they take up residence in your lungs, your kidney, uh, your liver, your pancreas, your brain, somewhere else that we can't just remove and not worry about. And when they do that, that's when they can lead to the organ failing and that can lead to your death. That's why it's important you try to catch cancer early, uh, especially before it's traveled, so you can just hopefully remove the section that's cancerous and the rest of your body is okay. You know, it's, it's completely gone. Because if you leave cancer cells behind, they're just going to keep reproducing until eventually they're back and you have to deal with the same issue. And if they've migrated in the meantime, you have problems again. Now, one last thing. I know a lot of people say, like, oh, I inherited cancer. You, you don't inherit cancer, but... Some people have mutated oncogenes that they pass on to their offspring. It's in their sex cells. So the offspring inherit some of these safeguards, some of these protective genes already messed up. So instead of having six different genes protecting them, they might have like four. So in the case of BRCA1, BRCA2, these are two genes for breast cancer. So you could have someone that has both of those already screwed up. So they're already oncogenes. 
And so they still have tumor suppressor genes, there's still other safeguards, but there's fewer safeguards. So it makes them more likely to have the good safe genes get mutated and for them to get cancer. So it's not a guarantee they'll get cancer, but it's a higher chance and a chance that they'll get it earlier. Because most people don't have to worry about cancer till later because it takes time to accumulate all of these breakdowns in a single cell. Because one cell has to have all these genes messed up. As long as you have one or more of these genes functioning, it typically prevents you from getting cancer. So to get this, it takes time or you can have some of them that you inherit already screwed up, which means there's less time needed because you just don't have as many uh, uh, safety pl places or safety genes already in place to help make sure that you're safe. All right, that's it, guys, for Unit 3. I'll see you soon.